Okay. My name is Janet Siegel. I am currently the chair of Charleston County Library Board of Trustees. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I bring a warm welcome to all gathered here this evening. Our community has changed in the last year. I think a year ago, we were best defined as Merriam-Webster partly defines community as a group of people with a common characteristic or interest living together within a larger society. We were much more disconnected. Many independent clusters living within Charleston. But then, united by tragedy and by the love and grace shown by the families of Mother Emmanuel, who were our friends, family, neighbors. Many people, not all, but many, have made a conscious choice to open their hearts to strangers and to begin dialogues about race, social justice, and the need to respect each other. We use the word community a lot. We describe Charleston as a community. Maybe we're getting there. To prepare for this, I called my five-year-old granddaughter, Serena, and asked her if she knows the word community. She did. And then I said, what does it mean? With absolutely no hesitation, she responded, people that help our world. She's five. Five words that actually made me cry. <laughs> now, admittedly, Serena comes to her definition through our religious teachings and studying the Hebrew phrase tikkun olam, a central concept of Judaism that translates to repair the world. I want to live in Serena land. And I want you all there to live with me there. Because together we can heal the world. Tonight we are being introduced to a book that was written to help repair our heartbroken city. The public library is the appropriate place for the storytelling of our community. And we are very fortunate that three of our most accomplished citizen leaders decided to work together to write a book. Words heal. And I am certain that their efforts will help us all as we continue our journey together because we are Charleston. Thank you. I'm Cynthia Bledsoe, Acting Director for the Charleston County Public Library. Janet and I did not confer on our addresses. Um, that might have been a smart thing to do. We share some common points, but I suppose that's not too surprising either. The library was particularly affected by the loss of one of our staff members. Cynthia Graham Hurd had been with the library for 31 years. And in a library system that spans the entire reach of the county, not every staff member knows every staff member. But most people knew Cynthia. They knew her not only because she had worked in several locations, they knew her because of who she was. They knew her smile, they knew her interest in children, literacy, public service, and because she was fun to be with. You know, it was just a great pleasure to be with her. After June 16th, of course, we were heartbroken, as, as most of you were too. But people started to share stories with us. And that's what a community does for each other, is share those stories. And, and the library, as Janet mentioned, is the perfect place for stories. We heard from people all across the county. We heard from people all across America. 
We got countless cards. We had wonderful posters that children drew. We had individual drawings from children, which were quite touching. We had cookies. We had cakes. We had poems. We had just an outpouring of love and support, but also stories. People told us about that Cynthia was their librarian, as I put it, she was my librarian, which I love that, that personal phrase. Um, they told us about how Cynthia helped them find a job. They told us about how Cynthia was the one that introduced their children to books and how their child was now in college. And just story after story after story. But I know that it wasn't just within the walls of the library that that happened. Uh, people told us things about Cynthia that we didn't know. I mean, of course, we, we saw Cynthia at work, and so we heard things that we hadn't heard before. And one of my favorite stories, because it seems so um, truly out of the walls, I was in a shoe store, and the man at Cass's Shoe Store said to me, Cynthia worked with my brother on the housing authority board. And she, he said, do you know that when we had a death in our family, Cynthia drove to Columbia to be at that funeral? Wow, I knew Cynthia worked here, and that meant every other weekend. I knew Cynthia worked at the College of Charleston Library when she wasn't working here. But Cynthia found time to do things all across the community. Now, this was not just about Cynthia course. Cynthia is just one person in this very large story. But our authors here spent the last year talking to people about those stories, you know, talking to people in the community, talking to family members, and trying to make some, I can't say sense, but trying to put together a sort of narrative of We Are Charleston. So we're very fortunate to have them here. Um, Dr. Bernard Powers, Marjorie Wentworth, and Herb Frazier. We're just thrilled and looking forward to hearing what you have to say about the stories here in Charleston. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for having us. Um, I think we're, we're hoping, we're going to talk for a bit about how we came together to write the book and um, do a little reading from the book and then we're hoping some of you might have some stories because um, everyone has stories about Cynthia. So, um, I guess we'll start with just talking about um, uh, how we came together to write it. Yeah? Well, it started with you, Mark. You called me. <laughs> <laughs> me and my big ideas. Yeah. <laughs> well, she called, and uh, we all want after the tragedy. Of course, we all wanted to do something. Um, we didn't know immediately what that something was. And of course, for me, <clears throat> having uh, grew up, grown up in Emmanuel, spent the first 14 years of my life in that church, and this neighborhood around this library church, when Marjorie asked would I help her with this book, I immediately uh, felt as though her call to me was somehow God-inspired, spirit-driven, because my father initially was a member of Emmanuel before he transferred his membership around the street on Alexander Street, the Memorial Baptist, uh, Baptist Church. Um, and, and my grandmother was a member of the church, and she always made it a point that uh, I go to Sunday school, go to service. I would not always go to Sunday school. Sometimes I would cut Sunday school <laughs> and do other things. But I would make sure that I was there because she was going to be there at the eleven o'clock service. So this book was important for me to uh, convey and to not only um, talk about the neighborhood and some of the people in the church that I remember as a, as a child, but also to capture you know, as we all wanted to do, the service to the church and the community that the, of the Emmanuel Nine, and of course, talk about those five who, um, who, who, who survived this tragedy. 
And so we started out by going back and understanding and trying to understand the why, trying to get at the why, trying to answer that question as to the why. And of course, we put this book in a very, I think, with Dr. Powers' uh, help after uh, Marjorie called me. I knew Bernie from my days at the newspaper, and I knew that he had done quite extensive research in AME history, and we needed to explain that uh, history and put the church in the context of not only the race relations in the United States and Charleston, but also the talk about the AME denomination, because people around the country don't know what AME meant. For them, that was, for us here, we know that. So, um, so I called Bernie, and, um, and fortunately, he agreed. And then we got to work and started planning how we were going to present this book, write this book. And, and you know, I think one of the things, uh, well, I'm sure one, one of the things that happened was that we, we went through a, a real rigorous process of self-editing, but also editing one another's work. Uh, we divided up the subject uh, into different chapters, and uh, I wrote most of the the chapters that were, that were more historical, but was involved with some of the others, and, and, and the other chapters we divided up, and then we shared them with one another. And uh, we were able to uh, severely, when necessary, criticize one another's <laughs> work. But, uh, you know, the three of us had never written anything together before. Uh, I knew Marjorie, but I did, I did not know Marjorie well. We were acquaintances, and as Herb said, we had worked on some projects, but we had never written anything together. So this really was, was a, a project that could have derailed very, very quickly. Uh, but I'm happy to say that it, that it didn't. And uh, as a result of working together, we are we're, uh, far better friends now than we were at the uh, outset of the, of the project. And we certainly didn't have to develop you know, in, that, in that way. Uh, the other thing was that um, when uh, the events at Mother Emanuel happened, we, we were all working on, on other projects that were very important to us. But uh, we thought that, just as Herb said, this was so important. Uh, and it was important that since the three of us were here, it was important for us to try to do something uh, as people who were on the ground as opposed to people who come in for a week, a couple of weeks, or even a month or two. Uh, and you know, uh, we had and have friends, uh, relatives. Uh, I was with uh, Reverend Pinckney approximately one month before his life was taken. Uh, and, 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 and I have I've been in Mother Emanuel, down in the, the room, the fellowship hall there for meetings, meetings with him and others. So we, we really had this, 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 this very compelling and visceral connection to that congregation. And that, that really is what drove the project forward. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we could do something that, um, that we hope would do justice to the, the lives of the, the people who <coughs> lost their lives and, and also the survivors. Something that we hope would contribute to their greater permanence in the, in the record. Well, I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's great. Um, yeah, but a lot of people want to know why, how we came together and why. And, you know, everybody wanted to do something, and that's what we could do, for sure. And, um, you know, um, and before we start, I just want to say a lot of people at the library really helped us. Um, particularly um, with answering questions and, and um, getting us in touch with Cynthia's family and a lot of her friends spoke to us and um, it really it really helped you know getting those kinds of stories that you're not going to get in the newspaper and we're going to share share some of those with you um, in a little while but you're going to 
Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. <coughs> so uh, I'm going I'm just going to kind of start this off, and I'm going to uh, talk about uh, something that I'm just calling Cynthia Graham Heard magician. <laughs> Cynthia Graham Heard magician. And uh, the first observation that I'd like to make is that uh, Cynthia was uh, part of a long and deep tradition here in Charleston, a, a tradition of learning and a deep tradition of education in the broader community, but in the, the African American community in particular. And to, and to really appreciate this uh, tradition, I, I go back to something that uh, in the African and African American tradition is a phenomenon known as, and some of you all are familiar with this expression, the talking book. The talking book. And so Africans generally didn't have written language. So they weren't literate, they were pre-literate generally. So when, when they encountered Europeans who had these books and they read from them aloud, it was as though the humans who were reading were performing something magical, and the book was speaking through them. And this is what, what Africans observe. And, and they refer to talking books, the talking books. And, and so that's part of this deep tradition of learning and education that existed here in Charleston from a very early date going back to the, the, the 17th century. Now, I also think about uh, within the framework of this, this subject, the, the free black communities that existed here in Charleston before the Civil War. And uh, there, were, there were free black schools that were maintained by African Americans, black Charlestonians who were not slaves. But there, but there came a point in time when those schools maintained by free blacks were outlawed. It was illegal for a free black person to maintain his or her own school. Uh, the law required a white person to be the instructor and supervisor for, for such a school. But we know that there were free black Charlestonians that defied the law. And, and we know that a significant number of those who defied the law were women. Uh, one of them was uh, a woman by the name of Mary Weston who maintained one of these schools in uh, variance with the law and against the law, and we know that she was even arrested. Uh, but that's just a kind of an example of the, uh, the links to which people in this community were willing to go in order to educate themselves and to, to promote learning and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, after the Civil War, Emmanuel, as we know it, really developed as a congregation. And we talk about that process in the, in the book. And those of you all who know the black church, and I think everyone in this room certainly does, understands that uh, the black church was really the foundation for a whole host of other institutions. Emmanuel was no exception. And so uh, within a couple of years of the end of the Civil War and the, the onset of emancipation, Emmanuel supported two Sunday schools that taught over 300 students, almost 400 students, actually. <coughs> and uh, to fully appreciate the Sunday schools, you have to remember that uh, a lot of times uh, people who were working only had an opportunity to attend uh, a school on a Sunday. And this is how they learned how to read. This is how they learned how to write. In addition to the sacred lessons that were taught in those schools. And so Emmanuel played a critical role in, in this community in, in that regard. And of course, this is Cynthia's church. Cynthia's church. And you know, sometimes people who observe these early African American students uh, observed that their quest for education was, it was as though they were pursuing gold or precious minerals of some kind. They vigorously sought an education. One observer said it was as though they believed that an education could perform magic in their lives. And it could. And it does. And it does. Because 
education makes us, or at least enables us to become what we are not, but what we have the potential to be. And certainly Cynthia realized that. And this early generation of black students realized that. And, and then if we, if we come to the early 20th century, come to the, the 1920s, and the case of Susan Dark Butler, who's very near and dear to this, this, this library tradition and the history of, of Charleston. And we see that she would, an African-American woman, she would take her father's uh, Charleston industrial and normal school and transform it into a reading room for African-Americans in the late 1920s. And she did this after a, a black female student came to her in quest of some, some information for a project that she was writing, having to do with the literature of Shelley, Keats, and Byron. And Susan Dart Butler, at that point, was, was so moved that she used her father's library uh, and made it available to the community. And it would, that library would become the centerpiece and the nucleus for what would eventuate uh, in the Dark Hall branch of the public library for African Americans. And that's the place where I encountered Cynthia for, for the first time. I'd gone there to use some records, and she was there, and, uh, and she assisted me. Uh, and, and, and of course, she was uh, on staff at the College of Charleston, and I would encounter her there also. But let me, <clears throat> let me uh, conclude by just making, making these remarks. Um, you know, Every, every time I go in Dark Hall uh, Library, I think about the significance of that building and what it, what it has meant historically. And I'm certain, although I never talked with her about it, that Cynthia also understood that significance and probably felt it in the same way that I, that I felt it and feel it when, when I go within its walls and think about the mission that, it's, that it has served. Uh, I think about how much magic occurred in that place and how much magic Cynthia contributed to and how she helped people become what they were not, but what they had the potential to be. And that's really why we wrote We Are Charleston, Tragedy and Triumph at Mother Emanuel. And I hope, as well as my colleagues, I'm sure hope, that those of you all who read the book and encourage others to read it will also be encouraged to perform magic in the lives of others that you encounter, the kind of magic that Cynthia was known for. Thank you very much. Well, I, I always need to take notes when he talks. I just I learned so much. Um, you know, I walked in here and saw downstairs the, um, the big read poster um, signed with, you know, Jonathan Green's signature, and, and that was a project, that's I think when I first met you, and I'm pretty sure Cynthia was involved with that, and uh, you know, I, I mean, when I think of Cynthia, we're sitting across the hall, around that big table, organizing poetry workshops here, or the big read, or Capital Book Fest, or um, poetry and jazz with uh, Jack McRae and Jonathan Green, and, and I, th I think there's a picture of Jonathan and Cynthia that I keep seeing that I think was taken that night. Um, you know, I was named a poet laureate and immediately thought, wow, we gotta do stuff in libraries, right? Workshops and what have you. And you know, Cynthia was always involved with anything that had to do with literacy and writing and bringing programs into the community. Um, I don't know how many of you remember Capital Book Fest, which was, um, I forget when that was, but that we took over the library. I mean, I, you know, so many events. Um, and DART, uh, boy, we did all kinds of stuff at DART. Um, Marcus Amaker still goes down there and does readings. Um, so when I think of, of really, really what my job is as Poet Laureate, which is 
bring writing programs and literacy programs into the community, um, I think of Cynthia. And I do want to add that almost everyone we meet has a story, um, so many stories, and I wish we could have fit them all in the book. Um, I mean, of course we couldn't, but that would be another book. Maybe we'll do that first. But um, just so many stories, and um, we tried to give that, that sense in, in what we wrote. Um, and um, I want to thank her brother Malcolm, who, um, you know, one of the, who became, has become a friend, um, and that's been a real blessing to me. He's been so generous with his time, um, and I want to read something uh, that he recently said to National Public Radio, and I, I want to kind of start with that. He said, my sister um, was more than a victim at the church. Um, she was a cousin and aunt, a librarian, a commissioner, a friend. She was so many other things and a victim. My focus has been remembering how Cynthia lived versus how she died. Cynthia lived an extraordinary life, a storybook life. Now we'll add magic. Um, she was personable. She was sharp. She was candid. She cared about her community, cared about her church, cared about her God. Um, I thought that was beautiful the way he summed that up. Um, and um, what I'd like to do is just read a little bit um, from the section. Uh, it's called People in Service to the Church. This is the chapter. And uh, one thing that we found is that, you know, this is a really an AME tradition. Um, Reverend Pinckney, for example, uh, we were told many times he was a minister first and his work in the legislature was just an extension of that. Um, you might want to speak to that a little bit about the, just that that's part of the AME tradition. And Cynthia, of course, that was very much what she was about as well. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about her childhood. She was one of six children, the oldest daughter. Um, her father was a truck driver, her mother was a domestic worker for a couple of families on, on Church Street. Um, the, their parents died more than 20 years ago when she became the matriarch of the family and still lived in the house downtown um, where they all were raised. And she called, according to Malcolm, she called it the family compound. Um, now what's interesting, and I didn't know this until I met Malcolm, she was a math major. Now, I'm someone who has similar interests to Cynthia, and I would never even have thought about math. So I think she, she clearly was someone on both sides of her brain working. Um, but she eventually commuted to USC um, to get her master's degree in, in library science. And um, I know they, they, I think, set up a, a scholarship um, in her honor. And um, one of the stories Malcolm loves to tell is how she loved to read the World Book Encyclopedia. And I'm somebody who um, can't read the dictionary. If I get a dictionary out to look up a word, I just get so distracted. Like, I'm, I'm still reading it, like, an hour later. So I just loved thinking that Cynthia would read the encyclopedia um, start to finish. Um, so that, you know, the family grew up in a manual. Um, their parents are buried at the cemetery. She was on a lot of committees, and we found this with, with everyone who was the Bible study. They, these were the people who were in leadership positions at the church, the Sunday school teachers, the stewardship committee. Um, people just completely devoted to Mother Emanuel. Um, she was on the usher board. Um, she was often either at the library or there. Um, and of course we know um, it's right down the street. Um, she um, also was very community focused. Um, she kind of looked at her work, in, according to Malcolm, she looked at her work in the library as being more than just like sitting behind the desk. Um, she would sort of get, and I've heard people tell me stories, oh, she went out and got me on the street and, and this and that and help people get jobs and um, this, those kind of constituent services that aren't, you know, just checking books out. There's, there's so much more that goes on, um, helping people at the computer and what have you. Um, you know, looking for a job um, and questions that they had about a book. And that's public service. You know, if you think about um, everyone who was at Emmanuel that night, I mean, you know, none of them were investment bankers or corporate people. Not again that I'm against that, but, you know, everybody was a, a, a teacher, a coach, obviously a librarian, um, you know, um, many were ministers, and, and you know, there was no separation. Um, 
you know, the, 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 the spiritual life was, was part of the way they lived in the community. They didn't separate out how they practiced their faith. And I think that's something really instructive for the rest of us. And Cynthia embodied that. Um, she worked as a librarian 31 years. Um, and in the Charleston Library System, as, as Janet and Cynthia said. Um, and she also was at the College of Charleston Library 16 years. She'd go over there and work sometimes at night. Um, she was always working. Um, she um, was known for running vagrants off over at dark. She <laughs> you know, didn't want people to bother the kids. Um, but she used to say, I love this quote, um, you can't wait for folks to come into the library. So she, she'd just go out and draw people in. And it was really a kind of a ministry for her, I think. Just the way Reverend um, Pinckney, you know, was in the legislature. I think that that's just, again, part of what characterized all of these people. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Kim, is Kim Odom here? I don't see her. I am so um, nearsighted. I'm going to get bifocals one day. Um, um, she was a dear friend of Cynthia's. I know many of you know her. Um, and she told us a little story about um, when she started to work at Dart Library like, over a dozen years ago. Um, Cynthia took her to her desk, introduced her to the staff, and said, let's go. And Kim said, well, where? And she said, to drive around the community. Before you know what to do, you've got to know, you've got to know who, you, who we serve. Um, and, and that's just a, a, great, a great story about her. Um, so, you know, this, we, we have other pieces of information, of course, about everyone there. We try to weave the, the past and the present together. Uh, because they're so they're so linked, um, and I think I'm going to turn it over to my colleague here. <clears throat> well, I didn't know uh, Cynthia personally. I met her through my work, my current my day job. We're not staying up all night writing books. <laughs> uh, my day job, uh, I do the marketing and public relations at Magnolia Plantation and Gardens. And a few years ago, I got the bright idea that what I wanted to do was to create an event at Magnolia that we call the History Fair. It's an outdoor gathering of some of the most historic organizations in the city of Charleston. Of course, we were dripping with history. And I said, let's capitalize on that and give um, the Charleston community a way to interact with some of these historic organizations. And what we found out later was some of these historic organizations, because they're so busy doing what they're doing, they didn't have an, a an opportunity to be in a collegial atmosphere to interact with one another. So I saw Emmanuel as one of those historic organizations for obvious reasons, and the Dart Library. So I called the library system. I was um, passed on to Cynthia, who passed my request on to Kim. And so Kim would came one year, I think, and in and, and 2014, uh, Cynthia came and represented Emmanuel. I think in that, in, in that um, presentation of Emmanuel, she wanted to do something a little bit better in 2015. So she put together a table display with historic pictures of Emmanuel, Richard Allen, some of the early church edifices, and some other uh, material that she could put on the table. Uh, she did that in 2014. And she was going to come back and do it again last year. But I think she was going to be out of town. So she couldn't come to the History Fair last July. Um, so the night of June 17th, she was at the church to pass that display on to Willie Glee. Uh, and ordinarily, she would not have been at Emmanuel on a Wednesday night because she would have been over at Addlestone at the College of Charleston. She wanted to make sure that the church was represented properly at the History Fair last year. And I spoke to Willie, uh, and when he heard about what happened, he didn't, you know, he didn't have any reason to believe that she stayed 
for Bible study. But unfortunately, we know what happened. Now, her good friend in the library system is Marvin Stewart. One of her good friends, let's put it that way. I didn't know until any of this that Marvin and Cynthia were good friends. I didn't know, actually, that Cynthia was a member of Emmanuel until this history fair you know, event came about. And in talking to Marvin, I didn't know that she was such a talented person. And I didn't know, I knew she was a mathematician, but she used that creativity to do things that I wish I could do. You go to Marvin's house, Marvin's, one of the rooms are the downstairs of Marvin, I hope you don't mind me putting your guilt out like that. The it's, okay. it's in the book, so they won't be there. I mean, I can't, can't hide it now. But, um, you go to Marvin's house, and his room, he sits and he watches television, same room he was probably watching the NBA Finals last night. In that room, the wallpaper, looks like books on a shelf. That was Cynthia's idea. Marvin's a librarian, she's a librarian, so that room was a reflection of over there, shared uh, interest in books. The ceiling fan keeps him cool. She put that ceiling fan. You step out of that room and you go into the dining room and into the living room, the draperies and the balances, I think, I think that's what you call them, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not in the drapes. <laughs> she did all of that. She told Marvin that the room has to have a theme. <laughs> well, the room has a theme. African art, if I remember correctly. So, and she took it upon herself, as she does in so many endeavors, to be very, very attuned to detail. Detail. And it is a giving. We have in the book, Marvin shared with me a story. His daughter wanted to go, was going to the prom one year. No, be a Marvin's daughter. Yeah. yeah, Marvin's daughter. Was going to the prom. And Cynthia, Marvin and Cynthia had a kind of a brother sister relationship. And Cynthia helped Marvin get his daughter ready for the prom. And she needed an accessory, a shawl, something for the dress. We didn't, he didn't know what it was. She knew what it was. And so she provided the shawl that accented her dress. And she never asked for it back after the prom. She's a very giving person. So um, we could go on, but I think we probably have, what, Q&A now? Yeah. Or, or anyone wants to share a, a story, Cynthia's story? I'm going to take that risk. Okay. <laughs> uh, I am um, a member of the Schomburg for 100 years. It's a library in New York. And they have poetry readings and that sort of stuff. But, it's a nice place to meet people, and I used to go there often. And I met a friend here, and then that friend took me to a poetry reading at the Darts Hall li Library. And I walked in there, saw it, saw this um, attractive young lady, and I said, oh, let me say hello. I went up to her, and uh, it was on my best behavior, <laughs> and we started talking. And I said, in your name? She said, oh, it's Cynthia Graham. I said, Graham? I said, that's my mama's maiden name. She was my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what happened there. But anyhow, we, uh, and it finally got me also to try to get the family back together again. Because we had been from Guatemala to Charleston, all, all, around, the, all around this area. and. Um, we got to be, I think, fairly good friends. And uh, I 
but I thought that was a nice little thing that kind of livened it up a little bit <laughs> because you guys are getting not more, but you know you. Yeah. <laughs> get it on. <laughs> basically sort of connected in a way. And we had to do that to make sure that um, <clears throat> transitions were there yeah. um, uh, and, and that you could sort of, it just got, sort of kind of flowed <coughs> into one chapter, one paragraph flowed into another, a thought or a theme flow, flowed into another. And so we, we knew basically, you know, from beginning to end where we were going to go basically started in the beginning. And we started with the event. And we talked about forgiveness. And then we talked about the flag, the flag coming down. And then that's when Bernie kicked in. <laughs> Taking us back and providing that historical context for all of what you just read. And then we end back in the present, <coughs> sort of what's next what needs to be done. Um, so it's sort of framed by the present, but even when we're in the past, we're, we're trying to dip into the present because um, you know, so much about the past and the place has to do with the situation. Um, you can't really understand it if, if, if you don't con contextualize it, but we didn't have much time. We couldn't have done it any other way. It would have been choppy. And, um, we moved a few things around, but it, that's the only way we, I think the editor asked, he knew, like, this is the only way they're going to get this done is if they do it in thirds. So we really did a third a month. That was pretty much it. Um, that's how fast we had to do it. All, so. We didn't have a lot of time to get lyrical. <laughs> we tried, yeah. Oh, yeah. Weaving it all together. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can, I can remember one, one evening, and, and her view. Call this. Herb and I were on the phone, and we were, we were. I, I think we were, we were either working on the same chapter dealing with the civil, yeah, either or civil rights, and and we were actually we were talking on the phone, and it was midnight or one a.m. I felt more like four. <laughs> well, there were there, there were conversations at four four a.m. And, and we worked out how to integrate um, this section on Porgy and Bess, where we introduced Porgy and Bess, and yeah, why, it, yeah. why yeah. it failed to be performed here in the middle 1950s and took until 1970. And um, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I've told my, my wife over and over again, uh, I have to have so many books at home because Frequently, it is one o'clock or two o'clock, and you need something. And if you've got books in your own library, you've, you've got immediate access. And that was a good example of that that, that night. That yeah, we night. knew we wanted to have to have a reference to Porky Best because the J Yard is an important piece in telling the story of this neighborhood and of gentrification. And because when I grew up here, obviously, and I remember that building, that 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 stout building in front of the Gay Yard. Uh, but imagine in 1950, there was a lot of businesses around that building. And growing up in this area, which we black people called it the borough, we called it Anson Borough, the black folks just called it the borough. My grandmother would say, don't, and, and then of course, you know, there's an arch in the building. And my grandmother would always say, don't go back to arch, because it was kind of a dicey area. Just like in Charleston, people on the east side, your grandmother would say, don't go back to green. Right which is on the west side of the peninsula, if you don't know the history of Charleston. But one day I decided that I wanted to go back to Arch to see what she was talking about. 
And I went back there, and what I saw was a scene that I later saw in life as an adult was a scene reminiscent of the tenement building, Orgy and Bess. And so I said that, and so when you read and then come back, that resonates, you know, later on we talk about how Charleston, was a, and Orgy and Bess is obviously in the, in the context of how Charleston struggled with itself on how you want to have black, the idea of having a play here, black people and white people are going to be sitting in the audience, was unthinkable yeah. at that time, yeah. you know. And and the and one of the one of the production companies, the end, uh, they 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 wanted a divided audience, right. and they said no, they're not going to do it that way, you know. So. In your research, was Calhoun Street like a dividing line of some kind? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you remember that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Part, yeah. We can yeah. answer this one. Isn't there? Thompson has a history of African Americans, of black and African Americans, and white swapping places. It's like, they just move from one theory back and forth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of that comes from my, my grandmother, was a domestic worker. So, my, so she had to travel down to Broad Street or, or, or Trad Street, and then she'd come back here. And a lot of what was going on in her employer's home as far as the way she set the table, the kinds of foods, the presentation, all of that, and I didn't understand it then, but I now look back on that and I can say all of that was a reflection of her her work. She worked for a banker, forgot the, the man's name right now, but you know, all of that was a reflection. So we, there was always a swapping back and forth and a moving around and so again. Yeah. Charleston at some points was a very, in some cases, a very segregated city, yeah. but a very integrated city mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. And even just for readers who aren't here, just for them to visualize Charleston then and now, we thought it was really important. You know, we didn't want to have maps and things like that. So we, we really tried to try to uh, just give, give bring it to life, it. you know. And of course, it helped that he grew up and you know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, at one, at, at one point, Calhoun Street was, in fact, known as Foundry Street. Yeah, yeah. which is kind of It's like, I knew that, but I didn't know it easily. Yeah. They said they was the Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, King Street was a very, everything south of uh, Calhoun on King Street was more white. Everything north of Calhoun Street at one time was more black. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not that way anymore. Now it's yeah. Yeah. But. Herb, they also, Calhoun Street also had business, black businesses. You yeah. had the black drugstore, you yeah. had Dr. Right. Felder's office, you had the Brooks Brothers, you right. have all of those, it was a vibrant community. Yes. And the church was. And so was uh, View School at that time. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, my sister still blames the city for taking away her school. Uh, she taught there for I don't know how many years. But um, the school, but the city has never been an integrated city. It has been a segregated and some sections desegregated, but never integrated. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. A couple of things. Uh, I have a question for Marjorie. I, I can understand uh, Dr. Powers and, of course, uh, my friend, uh, her writing journalist historian. How did you see yourself? fit in there as a poet. That, that's my first thing, and then I'll comment on something. Well, else. I had written that poem for the newspaper Holy City, right. um, which really made me very quickly put my heart and soul into it in a way. I mean, I don't, it, everybody was heartbroken, but it made me just really hyper-focus in a way. Um, and, um, that wasn't the whole story, I mean, at all. And I think, you know, a poet's skill is empathy, really. Right. Um, you know, the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes sure. or another place. Sure. And um, that's kind of what I've been doing as a writer. And I've written nonfiction. I have another, a human rights book that's out that's nonfiction that I wrote with, with someone. And um, this clearly needed, to, there was so much more to tell. Sure. And I think that was really the instinct um, and also, I think I was—I always had an eye to. Our, our agent said very early on to me, 
I want you to imagine this book is on a library in Connecticut, 10 years from now. And someone said something like that. He goes, and they take it off the shelf. You have to, things that you know or are familiar to you, especially in the heat of the moment of last summer, you've got to explain that. Um, so I think that was also, I have a distance, you know, that distance in thinking of people who aren't from here, who've never been here, who don't even know what AME stands for. Um, so I think that was another thing. But I certainly knew it was, you know, a story that, <laughs> um, that required um, intimate knowledge with the place and the church and the, the history. Um, good early, question. <laughs> early, earlier this year, um, I had the good pleasure of, of meeting the author of The Cigar Factory. Oh. And um, I read her book, which was fabulous. My mother worked at The Cigar Factory, and so it, it just meant so much to me. I was very glad that she didn't work during the time that the book covered, but um, nevertheless, uh, it it helped me to understand exactly what that was all about, even more so as a child. I, I had very little appreciation for what she did sure. uh, as a rapper stretcher. Uh, but I just wanted to say, as we were discussing the uh, location, I lived as a kid right behind Emmanuel. It, it's now a piece of their parking lot. Oh, wow. My oldest brother went to Buse, and I went to kindergarten at St. Stephen's on Anson Street, it was, an Episcopal, well, it was still Episcopalian church, it was Episcopalian kindergarten. And as a kid growing up, uh, Anson Street was black neighborhood. That was <laughs> in the 50s. As was huh? As was Kevin. Right, exactly. So it, it, now, yeah, now the, the irony is, is I can't afford to live on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, you know, my grandkids probably would have to enter into a lottery to go there. To use. It's, it's really wild. We do describe the cigar factory um, strike. And actually, I think you interviewed someone whose mother mm. was yes, involved yes. with it. So that you'll love that part. We'll yeah. tell you what. Yeah, that that was a great book. I would recommend. No, we hear we he, we want to read it. We've heard great things. Yeah. yeah, it just came out. Yeah, um, we went to the signing. I think it was in um, February or March, something like that. Yeah. 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 I um, this thing was so heartbreaking and. Um, <coughs> terrible, terrifying, that um, I was moved by it and so are many people. It was um, something that shouldn't have happened to say um, the least about it. And I couldn't quite wrap my head around it immediately. It was, um, you know, how could such a thing have happened? And you mentioned in your presentation the why of this whole thing. I couldn't figure out, well, why would something so horrible occur? Not that there hadn't been precedent, mm. but in this time, you know, in the, in the post-civil rights era, mm. uh, where, we, uh, where we are, we're supposed to be uh, in, a, in, a, in another mindset about our fellow Americans and, and human beings. Mm. Uh, how could this young person uh, have um, internalized such terrible hatred? Um, I that that was what, what what got me, and I couldn't I couldn't figure it out. Now I've spent my career teaching African American history, like Bernie, and um, I didn't work here. I worked at Cheney University in Pennsylvania, where I retired. But I'm a, ch a native Charlestonian, and uh, my people go back for generations here. We've been in this area since over 200 years. And uh, so uh, I was quite uh, disturbed by what, what had occurred. I wrote, I wrote a poem, and I, I don't know, I don't want to take up the time, 
um, I wanted to share it with you. I brought it because I said maybe I should share it. These are literary people, and they may they may may find it uh, worth worth hearing. And uh, so I brought it. I don't know. You can tell me. Uh, do, do you want to hear this poem? Sure. Because it's it's not going to take that long, but it'll take. Is it some an time. epic poem or is it a haiku? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a little too deep to be yeah a haiku. Uh, yeah. This is called Bible study. See why why why? Angry, confused, evil young man. Mean as Saul agree. Never knew African American, only slave study. Spirit deluded in 2015 with old white supremacy demons' lives. At 21, grotesquely, tried to play God with a gun violently at Bible study in Mother Emanuel AME, historic black church of my granddaddy, Esau the butler, who died in old age when I was five, over 70 years ago. Say, why, why, why? Nine lives lost, then found in an instant transformed. Nine martyrs made. No hiding place down here. The Payne Middleton doctor, Cynthia Graham Hurd and Susie Jackson, Ethel Lance Clementa Pinckney and Tawanza Sanders, Daniel L. Simmons Sr., Sharonda Singleton, and Myra Thompson joined the immortal sacrifice. Three survived to reform us, Polly Shepard, Felicia Sanders, and her grandchild, age 11. 20 years for traumatic stress added to her chronology. Bloody everlasting medicine for our diverse race sick society. Say now, now, now. God is love, nothing else you must understand. Hate filled, hybridized, evil young man. Where you at? One demon snared soul suspended high on a scale, sweating red in the heat over hell. We forgive you before you even ask. Dark saints shout and tell the world. May God forgive you. Repent before it's all over. Souls of lesser strength ponder bitter, futile revenge. Say, why, why, why? Charleston, South Carolina, Charleston SC wrestles, wrestles with its destiny. Holy city, really? Maybe Nazareth. <coughs> or any place with so many churches must be exceedingly evil. With an outsized liar, Calhoun, preaching eternal slavery, tiring over Marion, the integrated revolutionary army hero square, Hypocrisy, mendacity has falsified our history. Study the past well to understand today and plan for tomorrow. Take off the blindfolds and brainwash. Shed the slave mentality. Teach the truth about the 1739 Stono African Slave Rebellion, about black patriots in the battles of Cowpen, Sullivan's Island, and Savannah. No U.S. freedom would exist without them founding liberty, liberty's tradition. Public schools otherwise fail everything and everyone, their entire mission. End the boom and bust business cycle. Make enterprise more free by sharing and abolishing scarcity. Increase our democracy. Establish American techno technocracy. Promote the people. Tax the machines. Justify a restored <coughs> economy. Make, remove all impediments to wealth's divine circulation pay descendants of enslaved African huge rep reparations for slavery and discrimination. Harvest the goods you sow, city, state, and nation running forever in the black, ending gentrification. Just these few corrections would bring us closer to unity, nearer to perfection. Say now, now, now. Crowds come giving, hoping to purchase cheaply reconciliation and redemption from rank civic sin, misunderstanding grace, Heaps of hosannas and money, flowers and palmetto roses, water flows, freely from cold plastic bottles, damaging the ecology but chilling heat explosions. People sing praise and promise love while living multitudinous lies, searching still unbelieving the sacred verse, only knowing the truth shall set us free. Charleston weak, not strong, still unbowed, yet believes it's right to do wrong, as long as it can get away with crimes unfound, Time never erases our mortal sins. One simply dies going to hell, unless contrite and forgiven. That's why the massacres and tragedies, Charleston and SC, the whole country very dirty, needs a bath. That's why the flooding rains cannot dissolve the bloodstains. 
A motto should last forever. Charleston forgives but never forgets. Grace, not race. Keep giving, stop stealing and calling it fair dealing. Cease killing, stay willing to search for peace. Express love, stop hate, exhibit soulful godliness. Express love, stop hate, exhibit soulful godliness. We can make the society change, bring new hope to gain a world without end. Everybody say amen, amen, amen. And that's, that was my feeling about it, which still is unsettled. Is there another question? Um, I used to come to Charleston from New York for my summer vacation as a teenager. And um, I knew most of the people from Emmanuel. And I'm still having a problem wrapping my head around the reality that this really did happen because I think of all the publicity and all of the attention and then I think of the persons that I knew as just an ordinary person mm -hmm. and Susie Jackson, one of the um, older ladies, I met her family over 61 years ago mm -hmm. and I can remember when her father died um, they had the body in the living room in the Hanson Borough Project. And being from New York, I had never seen anything like that. And to make the connection between ordinary people leading ordinary lives and to have something like this happen, I'm still trying to meld the two together. We, we, we were uh, in an event in when the uh, some co congressional delegation came down here, and um, I remember Felicia Sanders, who you know survived, talking about being an ordinary person, but having to do extraordinary things, and saying that that's really what Jesus had to do. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but it was a really beautiful um, way to explain what she felt like. Um, in terms of what was expected of her. Um, so. I have a question which that sort of brings up. Um, what, and I'm not quite sure how to ask it, but what either permission or the family members that you told their stories, did they get to see it before it goes to press, or how do you work that kind of respect mm -hmm. for privacy? Yeah, well, we approached a lot of people who, um, uh, you know, some people we couldn't reach, some people weren't ready to talk. Um, I mean, her family members are sitting in front of you, and um, I know Malcolm, part of what he's trying to do is tell her story. Um, and we had to get permission um, with everything we used, um, you know, um, for obvious reasons. And even if, even if we did not speak to someone directly, we also had to document where we got material from. Everything. Fun, from. Everything. Bless you. And uh, that was you know, a, a very tedious yeah. process. Mm -hmm. And will there be any, um, is, is it the big read where we, Charleston picked a book and everybody read it? And yeah, we, that, that's, is that what that was called? Yes. Mm -hmm. So will anything like that happen? Oh, I don't know. The book, book? the book just came out. Uh, but like one community, one read. One, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot to talk about, for right. sure, especially, um, you know, I mean, each chapter um, is kind of separate in that way. Like, you can pull a chapter out and just, like, a lot of people don't associate Charleston with the Civil Rights Movement. You know, you think of maybe Alabama or Mississippi, but a lot happened here, and a lot, in, in the manual was very central mm -hmm. to that, Reverend Glover. Um, so that might be a section you could just pull out and, and, and learn from. So um, maybe that's a great idea. <laughs> uh, we'd like to eventually have a curriculum packet that goes with the book, um, you know, which would be great. But again, it's, you know, it takes some time and effort. Yes? Um, this may be best for Dr. Powers, but where, I, you know, I think we all want to have this tragedy taught. Um, but where do you see it in reality in 10 to 20 years in like high school? I'm a public 
South Carolina public school product, and I feel like I still don't know enough about things like the Orangeburg massacre and things like that that just are not taught because they're uncomfortable for folks to talk about. Yeah, which we make sure we mention that it's Good question. Yeah. Well, uh, my hope is that we'll have a greater effort made to, to really teach about issues related to social justice broadly conceived of. Uh, women and gender, uh, those kinds of issues as well as, well as race. Uh, in South Carolina, uh, African American history is supposed to be taught in the public schools, uh, mandated by, by law. But my, and I can only give you an anecdotal sense, uh, and talking with people, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot that's really done in a, in a serious way, unfortunately. Um, so, one of the, uh, oh, and let me just point this out also, that in today's environment where there's so much emphasis placed on the STEM disciplines, which are getting so much attention, uh, one, of, one of my fears is that the humanities, and in particular the kinds of issues that you're raising, are going to, in fact, they're already receiving short, short shrift. And, and, and there might be less attention, particularly as budgets get tighter. I mean, if we look at what is happening right here in Charleston County, the budget shortfall in the end, essentially the, the gutting the literacy program. How can this happen? How, how can this happen? So, I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to be negative, uh, I don't want to be pessimistic, but these are unfortunately the realities that we're butting up against. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I think the hope is in people who are committed and, if nothing else, individual teachers who kind of take the torch up and arm themselves intellectually and prepare themselves and adopt the philosophy, you know, each one teach one. In other words, one professional working with other professionals to try to, from classroom to classroom, get these things implemented at the ground level with, with, with students, one class at a time. Uh, we can be hopeful in that regard while we're trying to push for uh, greater focus on these issues of, of social justice. And perhaps, given, given what is happening here, uh, we may have a, a broader commitment to getting these things done. After all, I thought that flag was up there for the rest of my life, to be sure. I mean, if you had asked me to bet on it coming down, I never would have bet on it coming down in my lifetime. But nevertheless, it has happened. So. I thought maybe um, you, you guys might want to speak to about the the program you started, literacy, because I don't think everyone would know about it. Is that okay? I'm going to introduce Cynthia's brother, brothers, or Malcolm Graham. You want a microphone? I couldn't have written this book without him. Thank you, uh, her, Bernard, and certainly Marjorie. First, let me introduce my family. Uh, my sister, Jackie, uh, from Virginia Beach. Um, my daughter, Courtney. Uh, my wife, Kim. My brother Melvin, sister-in-law Verda, uh, and cousin Zebra over there. Uh, um, uh, great friend and of uh, all. Um, first, let me uh, thank the authors uh, of the book for really um, uh, doing uh, yeoman's work in a short period of time. Bernard and uh, and certainly Marjorie, um, uh, who I spent a lot of time with. Um, when we first met, uh, I think we just connect. I don't know what it was. We just, I think we had like a three-hour breakfast, uh, and, 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 and um, I ate and she wrote. <laughs> um, but we, uh, we really, we really connected, and I want to congratulate them on um, a successful uh, project. Um, we find ourselves always in the library. Um, we started today uh, at Dart Library. Uh, we went ran an errand and came back here to the main library in mid-afternoon and stayed for another workshop um, at 2 and here we find ourselves back again 
uh, this afternoon at 6. Um, and it's typical of Cynthia uh, keeping us in the library. <laughs> uh, and it just, just happens to work out that way always. Uh, and we felt like a need uh, as a family um, to not focus on how she died. Uh, but to focus on how she lived. And part of her, her life and her legacy was the Charleston County Library. And, uh, and books and reading and literacy and research and um, um, civic engagement. Um, since they also served for 21 years as a member of the Charleston Housing Authority. She was a commissioner. And so I don't know where she found all the time to, to do all these things, but, uh, and I guess that in Charleston, you guys don't believe in term limits. Um, <laughs> 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 um, yeah, she, she, she served for 21 years as a, a commissioner and talking about some of those same issues of gentrification and fair housing and affordable housing for, for all Charlestonians, especially African Americans living here on the, on the um, inner city of Charleston. Uh, and so we felt compelled as a family to establish the Cynthia Graham Heard uh, Foundation for Lit Literacy and Civic uh, Engagement uh, and to continue to carry on her work uh, as relates to uh, literacy. Uh, and uh, based on our uh, reading of the papers of the last two days, um, I think our work is needed here in this community more than ever uh, to kind of help fill the gap uh, in terms of making sure that uh, kids from kindergarten to third grade get the necessary tools and equipment to be proficient readers, which leads on to lifelong skills. Uh, so this month um, here in Charleston as well as in Charlotte, in conjunction with Reading Partners and the CBS affiliate Live 5 News here in, in Charleston and WBTV in Charlotte, we are doing a month-long book drive uh, to collect books, um, to donate it uh, through Reading Partners to after-school programs, nurseries, barbershops, um, where we, we can identify kids uh, to give them books to read as they're getting their haircuts are at an after school program. And so uh, the uh, book drive goes to the end of the month. And so there's more time to donate gently used books or go out and buy a book and, and donate a book um, to the drive. You can donate here at the main library. I think there's four other drop off points here in Charleston where you can contribute uh, by um, donating a books. Uh, or you could um, donate something to the foundation itself uh, and we'll supply that information um, um, to you as well um, um, to help us continue Cynthia's life work. Uh, Cynthia would be a little bit embarrassed um, uh, by all the attention and tomorrow she probably gets the greatest honor uh, where the St. Andrews Library will be renamed to Cynthia Graham Hur St. Andrews Regional Library. And uh, she's probably out there saying, what in the world are you guys doing? <laughs> and um, I, I got choked up for a while um, uh, simply because um, Cynthia used to um, joke with me all the time that, you know, my mom was a domestic worker too, my father a truck driver. and. Notwithstanding that uh, my brother Melvin had a very, very successful career. My brother Robert and, and Gilbert uh, worked for many, many years with the Charleston County School District. Uh, Jackie has been working with the DMV in Virginia for about 20 years or so. Um, we all, you know, um, fulfill the mission that my mom had for us, which is to get a great education. Is it a joke with me? What did you do? Huh? I just bummed around a little bit. <laughs> but since they used to joke with me that I was the most famous person in the family. Uh, I, I served for six years on the city council in, in Charlotte, 10 years in the state senate, and I successfully ran for Congress. Um, but in her death, Cynthia is certainly the most famous person in the family. I uh, ain't no doubt about it. And so uh, we miss our sister. Um, uh, we missed 
um, coming to the library seeing some this. She was certainly have been somewhere in the midst uh, doing something, um, uh, telling me to be quiet or whatever. <laughs> uh, it is a library now, you know. That's what she would always say when I would come and create some chaos in her workspace. Um, but um, certainly she would be uh, embarrassed by all the attention that she's been receiving. Uh, she would probably say that um, uh, it's really not about her, uh, that eight others as well um, laid down their lives um, uh, in our honor too. Uh, and that she would probably say that the attack was really not against her and others, but it was really against a race of people. Um, that it was against the Christian church and that it was against humanity and that we all have to kind of take a look at ourselves in the mirror uh, and critique what we see. Uh, and that um, while we all must forgive, um, she would probably quote James chapter two, uh, that faith without works is dead. <coughs> so she would require us to be men, women of good faith and um, forgive and do all those things that we are required to do by our faith. Uh, that then she would encourage us to get to work uh, and do the work that's necessary to eradicate racism and discrimination and hatred uh, and literacy problems and issues in terms of other uh, voting rights, the flags, and there was, again, part of the foundation work is civic engagement as well. And uh, she would require us to do the work necessary to create positive change uh, not only here in Charleston, but throughout the state of South Carolina and our nation. So I just encourage you to support us as we try to uh, continue to keep Cynthia's legacy alive. Um, I'm not here standing up for me, but Melvin and Robert and Gilbert and Jackie, uh, as well as that our entire family to help us uh, grow this foundation, help us continue Cynthia's work. Um, we know we have a great partnership with the Charleston County Library. We want to continue that partnership. And, but we want a partnership with anyone who wants to work with us. Uh, our goal is to, to give back, not to take. Uh, and that's what Cynthia would require us to do, uh, uh, to, um, to give back uh, and to continue to um, talk about a city that she really, really loved. I, I tried to get Cynthia to, Char to Charlotte for many years as she refused to leave, and um, um, she had a great difficulty leaving DART. Um, we talked many, many days when she was offered the opportunity to go to St. Andrews, and but she was really committed uh, to DART Library, and leaving that library to go to St. Andrews was a big deal for her, and because she was committed to uh, the inner city of, of Charleston and uh, making sure that um, her voice and the voice of many others like her remain strong and solid. So uh, please help us uh, keep her legacy alive through the foundation. Uh, if you're interested in the foundation, I'll give you a number, uh, which is my number, and uh, we'll have a, a website pretty soon. Uh, it is 704-576-4568. And my email address is m dot Graham dot one two at AOL dot com. That's M dot Graham dot one two at AOL dot com and we'll send you as much information as you want to know about the book drive and other things that we have planned for um, the foundation, we would love to come down here and probably in the fall and do a major symposium uh, and on the civic engagement side because um, we're committed to doing the work uh, and what I call creating healthy tension um, and creating healthy tension around these issues that, um, that are uncomfortable, uh, that makes people squirm in their seats and cheers um, that we got to talk about. And I think that's something that Cynthia would say, hey, let's do that. Uh, and we honor her and we honor the others um, by doing the work, doing the dirty work to advance positive change in our community. Thank you very much.
Yeah. yeah. Not only are we um, dedicating the library tomorrow, but tomorrow uh, would be Cynthia's birthday as well. And so not only is there the dedication in the morning, I think there's a birthday party for her in the afternoon at the library. And, yeah, and so so we are, tomorrow's a big day for us and, um, and also a big day for her. Thank you.